So I'm going to be talking about medical cannabis research at the Lambert Initiative. Um, some of you may or may have not have heard about the Lambert Initiative. It arose out of a very uh, generous and gutsy donation from the Lambert family. Uh, Michael Lambert was on the, um, in the panel this morning. Um, and many of you will be familiar with, with uh, their story. Um, and what the Lamberts did was basically put their money where their mouth is and uh, realise this is an important issue. So let's, let's see if we can fund someone other than government and other than a drug company to try to do some of the research that we need. Um, and, yeah, and well done to them. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in, in time, the, the generosity of the Lamberts, I think, uh, needs to be recognised in all this. Our main game is to try to unlock the medicinal potential of the cannabis plant. That's easy to say. And after that, it gets really hard and gets really complicated and gets all about nuances. The first thing I think we need to get our heads around, and again, this was touched upon in one of the presentations by, I think, was it Dan or Aidan yesterday, about what do we mean by cannabis use? And isn't all cannabis use medicinal? And to a certain degree, it is, because cannabis is cannabis, but I think we also need to recognise that different people use cannabis for different reasons. And indeed, some people use cannabis for all three reasons. And some people use different types of cannabis for all three reasons. So, what I mean by this is personal. A lot of people use, the, I don't like using the word recreational, which is, I think personal use is a, is a better term. Because recreational also somehow makes it sound as though, ah, oh, you know, take it or leave it, you, know, you can have it if you want it or not want it. And I think a lot of people are more heavily invested in their use of cannabis than that kind of uh, optional throwaway. So I think personal use, then we have the issue of wellness, that cannabinoids can be used as wellness. And so, and there's a long tradition there about hemp um, products. And then there's the issue of medical. Now, what are, what's the difference between wellness and medical? Well, by medical, I mean where you are trying to uh, help people who are sick, who have actually a, a significant illness which is impairing their quality of life, their function, their health. Wellness is actually about preventing illness. So I take this because this will actually make me feel generally health healthier and prevent um, future illness. And I think that when we're talking around how we're moving forward with medical cannabis, we need to appreciate that the systems that we set up need to probably be, di be different for each of these. And I'll come back to that at the end because we'll take in a bit of a journey on why, why I think we need different approaches for different uh, forms of cannabis use. So why do, what are the cannabinoids and just what is going on that this plant can have so many effects? Now it's not, it's not uh, an, an, well maybe it is an accident, but you know, there's a reason why cannabis works. And it works because we have what we call an endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system is basically our bodies are wired up with cannabinoids. And we have receptor systems that are, that are largely where the cannabinoids work. And the, the cannabinoids are in our brains and our bodies. So we are all cannabinoid factories. It's not only a cannabis plant that, you find that, that makes cannabinoids. We're all sitting here making cannabinoids whilst we're sitting listening to me or having your lunch. The main cannabinoids, the endocannabinoids, are these ones, anandamide and 2-AG. Then there's the phytocannabinoids in plants and there's the synthetic cannabinoids. I won't talk much about these. There's not much therapeutic application. Um, there is some, but I won't spend much time. Let's look at the endocannabinoids. So the endocannabinoids is why do cannabinoids work? And there's largely, we have what we call receptor systems. And there's largely two kinds of cannabinoid receptors. We will probably discover there's more. But for now, we understand the CB1. The CB1 is largely in your brain, and it does all these different things. And when you look at all these different parts of the brain where you find CB1 receptors, it pretty much does everything. Everything from pain relief to um, the way you think, cognition, um, balance, the way your body balances, its temperature, its, its salt water, its, its you know, how we learn, our emotional responses, why cannabinoids might work with things like you know, PTSD. Um, emotional fear and um, uh, so there's all memory all cannabinoids affect all these parts of the brain cannabinoids are also peripheral in our bodies and this is more the CB2 receptor system and, th and the CB2 system is heavy in a whole range of parts of the body that control inflammation um, and our immune system 
So the cannabinoids seem to be doing something to, to inflammation and, and the way our, our bodies work with uh, immunity. And, and this inflammation also has a big role to do with what we call neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is where the, the pain is arising because the nerves are firing incorrectly. So it's the, there's a problem with the nerves. That's why you're experiencing pain. There isn't necessarily something wrong with your knee. It's the nerve that tells you you think there's something wrong with your knee. And there's other kinds of pain as well. So the cannabinoids work in our bodies in a certain way. And then when we use plant-based cannabinoids, largely what we're doing is we're triggering our own systems. This is to a large degree how our opioids work. We have our own endogenous opioid systems. Actually, most drugs, many drugs, not all drugs, but many drugs work through these kinds of receptor systems. Now, the cannabinoids are amazing. They are, we have more cannabinoid receptors in our brain than any other receptor system. So this is not kind of like a peripheral thing that oh, we don't have to really worry about. It's just, you know, it's only in some people that like smoking pot. Far from it. The cannabinoids are actually really important in regulating so many functions in our body. And that's a way of thinking about them. They're kind of like a thermostat. So they regulate a lot of what's going on in our brain and also in our in, uh, in, in, in inflammatory and immune processes, which is why we're seeing so, such a wide range of applications of the cannabinoids. Now, when we're talking about the phytocannabinoids, there's lots of different phytocannabinoids. You all know about THC, and most of you hadn't heard of CBD, you've now heard about it. But they're just part of the picture. There are hundreds of cannabinoids, and then these other things called terpenes, which also do stuff that we're only starting to understand. The, terpen the terpenes are what provide the smell in cannabis. The cannabinoids actually don't smell at all. It's the terpenes which provide the characteristic smell. Now, each of these cannabinoids do different things. And then what gets really funny is, well, tricky, is put them all together or in different combinations and they change the way that each other works. So we just heard that THC on its own will do one thing, add CBD to THC and you get a different effect. Up until very recently, let's be really clear, THC and CBD is about all we were really aware of in a scientific community. Many of these have been mapped, we knew they existed, but we didn't really know what a lot of them do. And to this day, we still don't know what a lot of them do. So here's an example of the different kinds of cannabinoids that come from a cannabis plant. And this is really just like a top 10 list. Um, notice this, which of these are intoxicating? And the answer is one and one only, and that's THC. So all these other cannabinoids are actually not intoxicating. So it's when these families are saying, we're giving cannabis to our children, um, what they're often giving is stuff other than THC, and none of that is necessarily intoxicating. Some of them might have some mild sedative effects, but it's not getting them stoned. Now look at the kinds of areas. We are talking about a huge range of different kinds of areas where different kinds of cannabinoids might impact. And the bottom line is, this is all possible. We are still learning about this. And one of the real problems is, we've actually had real difficulties isolating each of these compounds to then see what each of these do, and then how do you put them together again to see how do they work in combination. So we've got a long, long way ahead of us to go. So, what is it that Australian cannabis users are smoking? Because we hear a lot about, you know, cannabis does this and I use cannabis for that. Now, uh, a few years ago, we were able to, the, uh, the New South Wales Police very generously donated to us over 200 samples of cannabis that they had seized from around the state and we went and analysed it. it. Took us a year to get the permits to do it, but eventually we did it. And this is, uh, these are the findings that we found. Basically, what we have in Australian or New South Wales-based cannabis, and this is stuff that the police seized, and this is largely stuff, guys, that if you live in Marrickville in Sydney and you go down to the corner, you know, down to, the, to, to, to buy your weed off the guy at the pub, this is probably the kind of stuff you're buying. So this is police seizures. We haven't gone to the boutique growers and asked them to give us their good stuff. This is the stuff that is out there the bikey weed, largely. And this is what we found. Basically, THC, mm, notice this, there's actually not much THC in a cannabis plant. Much of it is in the form of THCA, which naturally degrades into THC over time, and especially when you heat the plant. So if you're juicing your, your plants, you're getting a lot of THCA, but not much THC. Look at the, the CBD, guys. Almost bred out of New South Wales cannabis. Now, 
Guess where these samples came from? Which part of New South Wales would you, would you hazard the, the handful of samples that had any CBD in them? Northern New South Wales. So there's still some bushweed out there. Now bushweed had historically like 5% CBD and about 10% THC. So What's the source for that? Uh, it's a good question. It is a good question. It's basically, what you know, we can go and get samples of stuff that was being used 30, 40 years ago and some of it was tested back then. But you have to remember, guys, we did know, you know, like some of these molecules had not been discovered until the 60s and 70s and things like CBD, you couldn't reliably analyse in a lab. We actually didn't know how to measure CBD really until the last five, ten years. It's just the science of how do you just measure how much is in, is in, you know, is, is in something. So the technology is getting better to measure this stuff. This, no, this is, again, this is what the police gave us in bags. No, we didn't have control. The stuff you were out. Well, a lot of what the police had, they didn't know what they had. So here's, a, like, they, you know, they, this is just stuff in the cop shop. So we didn't have the full, you know, genetic history and the, and, and the, the um, you know, the, 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 the source of it. We did in some samples. And in some samples, we knew things like, was it an outdoor or an indoor grow? And if you look at indoor grow, higher THC levels than an outdoor grow, more CBG in an outdoor grow than an indoor grow, more THCV in an, in, in an outdoor than an indoor. For some things, it didn't seem to make that much difference. But look at all these other cannabinoids. So they are there in some cannabis plants, but not all cannabis plants. Now, again, I have to emphasise this is the stuff that the police seize off people. And I'm sure if we were to go to, to some of the artisanal growers, we would probably find a very different story. So that's the weed that people are using in Australia, probably the vast majority, the, if you're buying it from the guy at the pub um, um, in Sydney or Melbourne. The history of medical cannabis though goes way back, you, most of you are familiar with this, over 2,000 years of documented experience and widely used in Western medicine. So cannabis is one of the most widely used medicines by Western doctors in the 19th century and it was used for a whole range of conditions. So this is not as though it's kind of like, oh, it's never been used, it has been used. And it was widely used until prohibition and pretty much that was the end of it. That was the end of the story. Research dried up, it became impossible to, to have the products and for a whole range of reasons, if you wanted to do research, you know, it was really, really difficult and certainly difficult to use the stuff. The 1980s changed that and they changed that because largely because of um, HIV advocacy in the US where they were strong advocates and they were turning around saying, no, we demand to be able to have cannabis for, to help treat some of the, um, the problems associated with HIV AIDS. And then alongside the consumer advocacy, we're also now starting to get some of the scientific developments. We're actually starting to understand just what cannabis is and what does it do a little bit better. But we are still learning what's going on. And this is the challenge ahead of us. So basically, I've got what we call an evidence gap. Now the evidence that I'm referring to, then the gap, importantly, is not whether or not we can use cannabis now, but it's how do we make sure, how do, how do we bridge the gap to make cannabis mainstream in healthcare? And I'll come back to that. So basically what we've got is historically used for, for centuries. Lots of anecdotal reports and what we call case studies. So these are people saying, I used it and it helped me. So there's some of those in the medical literature, but not actually as many as you would think. Um, and often what medicine does is it, it doesn't publish the success story, it publishes the disaster case. That's just the, the nature of medicine. So we've got lots of case reports of THC making epilepsy worse. Lots of those reports, but very few case reports in the medical literature that THC can help epilepsy. Yet, yet we're hearing different things when you talk to people in the community. So we are now understanding the plant chemistry and the pharmacology. Animal data is showing us these cannabinoids can work for certain kinds of conditions. We have some smallish clinical studies that show us look, this stuff works if you give it in, um, in, the, in the studies that have been done. But because, it's, because of prohibition, because there hasn't been a pharmaceutical industry heavily investing in cannabinoids, we have not seen the funding required to do the big studies. A big study in medicine costs around $5 million to do, to do the big kind of randomised controlled trial that regulators and big medicine want to see in order to buy their contemporary standards. The other problem we've had is we've actually had very few good cannabinoid medicines that we can take to clinical trials. 
And there's, a long, and there's an example of that where New South Wales government said, let's do some clinical trials. A lot of us spent like six months trying to find somewhere where we could actually get medications from. It was actually not that easy. There is some evidence of harms. We've overplayed the harms of cannabis. That's what prohibition does. But we, shan't, we, you know, we shouldn't also dismiss that some people, you know, like any medication, some people get side effects to some drugs. So despite all this, um, despite all that, we are seeing strong consumer demand for making medical cannabis Australia. So historically in the last five years, it's sat around 70% of Australians say medical cannabis should be available. In the last six to 12 months, the surveys are coming out where this number is now up to 90% of Australians think that medical cannabis should be available. So there's this huge disconnect about what's going on, that on the one hand, the community is saying we need this, patient experience is this is working for us, um, and yet there's still a long way to go to get this incorporated into mainstream medicine. And a lot of this that we're talking about are people using in Australia today. We did a survey of 1,500 chronic pain patients, 16% of them said they used cannabis for their pain in the last year, 6% said they're using it monthly, and a quarter of patients said, if I could get some legally, I would use it for their pain. So the demand is even is, is high. We did a survey of palliative care patients recently um, um, done. Again, this is not asking cannabis users, this is asking palliative care patients sitting in palliative care units. 13% of them said they'd used cannabis for their palliative care. Uh, most said that they would be interested in using it. When we asked them, what would you like? And most of them said, just a tablet prescribed by my doctor as part of my palliative care, thank you. Some did want to vape it, but the majority just said, well, just part of my treatment. I just want a part of my treatment. I'm in hospital for my palliative care. Can I just have it as part of my normal health care? A recent survey done by Epilepsy Action Australia, um, and we've got some of them here. Again, you know, 18% of an online survey report of adults reported cannabis use for their seizures. And the vast majority said that the cannabis they were using, and probably that was probably just weed that they were buying, because these are adults, probably, I mean, the vast majority said that that was effective for their, for their epilepsy. And yet the medical literature on epilepsy is basically saying THC is probably not good for seizures. So we've got this disconnect between people's experience and the exposure and where we're up to in the medical evidence. So the challenge ahead really is prohibition has really, really sort of tainted the water here. What it's done is it's prevented good research. So we haven't got the research evidence that, that we normally expect in medicine and that regulators want. Um, the prohibition has prevented us from having a good understanding of, you know, doing the science to understand just how do the different cannabinoids work. The kind of research that people do are having to do undercover and not able to disseminate it, not able to share it. And the whole thing about research is you have to share it. In order for it to, to be valuable, research needs to be shared. Um, and generally we've got health providers that don't know the first thing about cannabis or cannabinoids or how they work. Um, so despite widespread use, mainstream medicine and regulators are really reluctant. Now when you go and talk to doctors, their general say is, look, most doctors say, yeah, I've got, I, I know of patients that, are, that have told me they use medical cannabis. I'm not necessarily against it, I just don't know enough about it. Uh, you know, it's illegal, um, I, need, I want to see better evidence, I want training, I want guidelines, and I want to also be able to have something I can prescribe if you want me to prescribe it. Um, and then the regulators and the politicians are cautious of the thin edge of the wedge. That's their concern. You know, if you make medical cannabis available, then everyone's going to be on it. Um, so these are the challenges. And the question is, so how are we going to change all this? How do we change the system? So the vision of the Lambert Initiative is to change the system. These are motherhood statements. You know, our overall aim is to optimise and introduce safe and effective cannabinoid therapeutics into mainstream medicine. And we're going to do this through a whole bunch of different research approaches, including looking at cannabis, chemistry, preclinical research, that's looking at you know, cells and animals, and then clinical research. And the clinical research is pharmacology type research. What do the drugs do? Clinical trials, which is do they work and are they effective and are they safe? And then health systems research, which is how do you roll this out in communities? The preclinical vision is really straightforward. I say, I don't have to do it. So this is the work of Ian McGregor, Jonathan Arnold, and they lead 
uh, this body of work. So it's going, getting all these different cannabinoids either alone or in combination, and then you run them through various models. Part of it is you do cellular research, um, you know, um, looking at what do the cannabinoids do, and then when you're confident, you've got a signal, you know, this might be the right one for sleep, for example. You then go and give it a whole bunch of mice and see, does it make mice fall asleep, for example. And then if, once you get these signals and have an understanding about what these drugs do, then the idea is you can take them into humans which ultimately is the, the main game here. Um, so where do we want to, our vision, and again, the vision here is not just us doing this in isolation, it's about really, this is a, a blueprint or a vision for where does science and where does the medical um, community go. So we need to identify and address evidence gaps. And much of this is, how do we learn from consumers and from clinicians? So the kinds of, so again, I love coming to these places. I actually learn more here than I learn from going to a traditional sort of um, scientific conference when it comes to cannabinoids. So there's a lot of expertise out there, and there's a lot of healers that have been using uh, cannabinoids and have developed a lot of ex um, e experience. And how do we pick up the, the, you know, look at the animal literature? And then we go and do the studies to gather the evidence that hopefully will change the way doctors and regulators think. We're also interested in the availability of cannabinoid medicines. Now, I think this is really important for us. So I think the focus needs to be on what I'm calling, G well, what is called GMP-grade cannabinoids. Now, what GMP means good manufacturing procedures or practice. And that basically means, look, can we come up with some medicines that have been grown in clean soil, not lead infested, that haven't had horrible fertilizers that are gonna poison the crop and had horrible pesticides. So, and that's kind of what we call GMP. Now, if you're gonna grow broccoli or garlic to sell commercially, you have to comply with GMP. So, you know, okay, it's different if you're going to do your own, you know, giving it to your friends and stuff like that. But if you want to become a commercial broccoli producer, you have to comply with certain kinds of standards that, you know, that the public will be protected. So when they're eating their broccoli, they're not going to be contaminated with lead from the fertiliser. So I think we need those standards when we're talking about we want, um, you know, quality medicines. The other growth area that I see is the development of new formulations. And anyone who spent time in the Americas will see just the explosion that is happening in tinctures, oils, tablets, preparations. And in many respects, this, I think, is going to be a huge growth area, uh, moving away from people having to smoke or vape um, plant matter. Not to say that that will be eradicated, but gee whiz, these new formulations are really exciting. At the moment, most of the therapies are THC and CBD based. But one day we're really keen to look at what do these other things do and how do we bring them into a research and into a clinical environment to make them available. At the moment, if I wanted to prescribe THCA, I can't. There's, there's you know, two places in the world where I can get quality enough THCA that, uh, that, that uh, my government or my ethics committee would allow me to give to a patient. Um, and it's incredibly expensive. Now, isn't this ironic? THCA is in, a, is, is in all those plants out there. Go and juice the stuff, and most of the cannabis in that plant is THCA at that point in time. Yet to be able to go and give this to a patient, we've got a lot of research to do to get to those standards. But hey, that's the, that's the, that's the process if you want to bring these things into mainstream. And finally, the translation. So how do we make sure that not only do we make these medications, figure out what they are and how they work, but then how do we make sure that they're getting used? And this is consumer engagement, educating health providers, developing up guidelines, doing the regulatory and policy work to change the frameworks, and ultimately, you know, let's look at how these things get used. What are the studies underway? I'm gonna quickly touch on these, like 10 seconds each. I'm happy to talk an hour on each one if you want afterwards, but um, I'll just quickly mention them. So. Uh, our priorities at the Lambert Initiative, because there's so many areas, you know, like people come to us and say, look, I've got ulcerative colitis, can it help? I've got you know, a range of, you know, we can't do everything, and even this is a very ambitious agenda, but our focus is going to be epilepsy, both child and adult, chronic pain and sleep, some of the mental health disorders, PTSD, a big one, and alcohol dependence. We're interested in cancer, both palliative care, how people can live with chemo better, and also what's the role of cancer in treating, so, cannabis and treating different cancers. But that's a huge journey, guys, and I um, can spend a day talking about how complicated that is. The other big growth area is dementia, and there's a lot of really interesting work about, uh, from, from mouse models 
about the protective, uh, the protective capacity of cannabinoids to slow down dementia, and that's really exciting stuff. We also address some of the safety concerns that the governments keep banging on about. Uh, driving and cognition. Everyone knows if you smoke pot, you, 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 you go crazy, you lose your memory and all those kinds of things. When you actually go and look at that data, actually, guys, the data isn't that convincing. It may be slightly convincing if you're talking about really heavy use in adolescence, but all drugs do that. The developing brain is a developing brain. You, you, you mess with it and things, you know, things aren't going, it's not going to develop in the same way. And that's not just a cannabis thing, that's a developing brain. But unless you're talking about children, there's very little, almost no evidence that there is any residual cognitive effect of cannabis use. I mean, it's, it's the, the evidence is very, very weak. Um, so the kinds of studies, so the first one, I'll just name what, what it is. Chemo-induced nausea vomiting, this is one of the New South Wales government funded studies. We are going to be using an oral extract of a THC CBD product uh, being manufactured by a Canadian company. So that is plant-based THC CBD, they've extracted it, put it into a pill, and that's the one we're using. We're interested in palliative care. Two products are going to be used. One is Namisol, the synthetic THC, that is pure synthetic, made in a test tube. Comparing that to a high THC cannabis bud product, this is a Bedrocan product that we're importing from Holland. I would love to be able to use an Australian GMP product. We don't have one in Australia yet. That will change. Uh, we're interested in the opioid sparing effects of cannabis for chronic pain. Most of the work around pain has been, does it reduce pain, does it reduce pain, does it reduce pain? And he's kind of, yeah, okay, yeah, we get that. But if you really want to change the way doctors think about cannabis in the pain field, because they're all basically saying, uh, we're not interested, unfortunately. The only way you can get the pain doctors on board, if you say, ah, and by the way, maybe cannabis will reduce the amount of other drugs you're prescribing, and then they reluctantly come on board. Oh, all right. Because they all know they've got a problem with the Oxycontins and stuff. They know that, there's a, that they've run into deep water there. And so it's, like, it's almost as though cannabis, the way we're going to, convince the pain doctors is demonstrating this is safer than the stuff you're using at the moment and probably works better. We're doing a cannabis uh, driving study. We're going to be using vaporised THC CBD um, from a plant, from um, GMP grade from Canada. And we're also going to be comparing that to just THC vaporised. So, and that we're quite, and this is paying on that issue. Does THC on its own vary from THC CBD? So most of the research that's ever been done on driving has been THC. No one's looked at a THC-CBD combination, and yet as we start to use this more and more and more and more medically, um, we need to be able to go back and say to the coppers, well, actually, all your data on THC is not necessarily what people are using, and here's, here's what THC-CBD does. And we're keen to do things like, yeah, um, you know, and what does the saliva test show, and what is the level of cognitive impairment, and what, and can the coppers actually, well, we're going to be doing them, we're not getting police in to do it, that'd be weird, um, but we'll be doing that, where we, again, we're going to do the field sobriety test and see how reliable are these. Um, now, this is a study where, where uh, we've kicked off, we're running now, we're recruiting now, we've done the first, I think, eight or ten people. So this is the project we're calling the Pelican study, and for us, this is, it's an important study, because it changes the normal model of doing research. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. So, we want to go and interview families who are using cannabis products for their children for epilepsy. The, the rules are, at the moment, they have to be under 18 years of age, the child, and at the moment, we've only got permission in New South Wales, and I'll tell you why in a moment. We're going to hopefully launch in Queensland as well. So, we want to interview families that are using cannabis, families that have used and then no longer using, and also families with, with children with epilepsy who have never used. And we want to go and ask them, look, tell us about your experience. What's it been like? Have child protection been on your case? What did the teachers say? What did your doctor say? Which doctors have you spoken about? Where, how do you get your stuff? How much is it costing? Have you had interruptions in supply? Um, you know, what, you know, what happens when you're waiting for the next batch to come, but it doesn't turn up in the post? So these are those kinds of experiences that many of the families, we're hearing many of these stories on a one-to-one -one basis, and we're kind of thinking, okay, look, let's, let's actually pull these together, because the stories of hundreds of families, um, you know, often uh, can be, can be uh, sometimes more powerful than the single case, although the single case can often be more powerful than the collection as well. So, you know, advocacy is important. 
So part of what we want is talk to people about the experience, but then we're also going to ask the families if they'll be generous enough to donate a small amount of what they're using. Because we want to run that in the lab to figure out just what it is that they're using. Because then we want to kind of get a sense of, look, we've got all these families that say they're using product X, Y, and Z, um, and they're saying it really works. And we ran in the lab, and that's, now we know what it is that they're using that they think really works. And then can we take it back into the lab, into the animals, to see, does this actually work in animals? So is this just their imagination? No. Or, no, look, this also works in a cell and it works in a mouse. And then hopefully bring it back into clinical trials. So the normal science process is, you know, some, some geek works it out in a cell, you give it to a mouse, you give it to patients. The Pelican model and, you know, where we want to do more and more of these kinds of approaches is go and ask the community about what it is you're using, figure, you know, ask them what they're using, take that back into the cells, the mice, do the studies to get it back out into the community. Now, you may ask yourself, gee, why bother? Why not just let them keep using it? And the reason I'd argue is that across the population, there's probably only 3, 5, 10, or maybe 15% of people who would benefit who are currently using products. And how do we reach out to the majority? Another, um, and we are recruiting the Pelican study. Uh, uh, there's some flyers um, that I'll have out there. People can come and get from me. The other thing slightly similar, um, that we're going to be, uh, which we launched um, earlier this week, is our cannabis as medicine survey. It's been a long time since there's been a big survey in Australia about what people are doing. Um, the last published survey was over 10 years ago, and that was back in the early days of the internet when there was only 150 people responded. Uh, I expect now we should be having thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands, of Australians that are prepared to put their hand up and say, yeah, I'm using medical cannabis and I want to tell, you, I want to tell my story. Um, and there's a number of surveys that are about to be launched, but the one that we've got up and going, we're calling it CAMS 16, Cannabis as Medicine Survey, and it's 16 because we want to roll it out on a regular basis. So next year, hopefully, it'll be CAMS 17, CAMS 18, and so forth. We want to know what, it's anonymous, uh, to, to be eligible, use cannabis for medical purposes in the last 12 months. What did you use it for? Did it help? Um, any side effects? And how would you like medical cannabis to be available in the future? So we want to get a sense um, of, you know, how, how would you like the system to, to, to look like? And you can access that at that website, and I'll have flyers. There's some flyers out there as well. I just want to finish up very quickly if I've got time. All right, yeah, very quickly. Where are we up to? So this is the you know, background stuff. It's no longer if, but how and when. I think that's where we're up to now. And th this is where it actually gets difficult because it's easy to argue the case for change than it is to actually figure out what change you want. And this is where it gets tricky. So first and foremost, I think we need different approaches for different conditions. The regulatory framework we want for personal use has to look different to the framework you want for medical use. And if we think the same framework will work for both, we will stuff both up. You do not want doctors in charge of your personal use of cannabis, but we also want uh, doctors involved in using cannabis for medical reasons. I don't say they have to own it, but we want them involved. Uh, you can come up with different frameworks and how you might use it for personal use, natural therapies and pharmaceutical medications. And there will be different products available through different systems What's required for personal use? We need to decriminalise and legalise. It's that simple, you know, it's just as simple as that, and let people use. Ultimately, for pharmaceutical, if you want to talk about, you know, treating really sick people, we want high-quality products that are being used um, um, as part of normal health care. And this is ultimately the game. This should just be part of normal health care. No longer the thing that is only available to people at the margins when everything else has gone wrong, when, um, and when, you know, basically people say, well, we can't help you no more, and then you have to go, and look, we heard the stories this morning. That is not ethical. It's just not a, you know, we can't continue propagating that approach in Australia. We need to, uh, and the discrimination is not just can you get access, it's the discrimination that follows. But that's going to take time, guys. That's three to five to ten years, I hate to say, but that is what it's going to take to end up with a proper regulatory model. A new medication takes seven to ten years in any area of medicine. We want to get a whole system up in that period of time, and we'll get there. But in the, in, in the meantime, we need some interim models. What's happened? Regulatory, there's an amendments act. Yes, 
Australian companies will be able to grow. There is rescheduling on the way. So at the moment it's a Schedule 9, which means it is illegal to possess it. Even if a doctor has prescribed it, it is illegal to possess it. That's changing to an 8, hopefully by the end of the year. And then each jurisdiction has to set up its own framework. This is what each framework needs to sort out. And we need to sort this out now-ish. Um, which drugs are we going to use? Which patients get access uh, for which conditions? Which service providers are involved? How do we learn from the experience? If we're going to roll out compassionate access to 5,000 people in the next three years, let's learn from that experience. Um, and many parts of America haven't. And we need some enablers. We need training of our providers. We need education of the community. And we need good guidelines. And how are we going to achieve this? Well, we're only going to achieve this ultimately by, look, I hate to say this, it sounds a little nice and sort of, um, you know, hug, huggy and stuff, but we're only going to achieve this by actually working together. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is a strong community advocacy. Without that, we're going to go nowhere. Medicine doesn't change and government doesn't change on its own accord. It needs to be driven, and it needs to be driven by very strong community advocacy. And the stuff we were hearing this morning, I hate to say it, that is the stuff which is driving the agenda and it needs to continue. As Barry Lambert recently was quoted, bad laws deserve to be broken. Um, and that's where we're at. And unfortunately, there's, you know, we're going to have to continue with people breaking the law and highlighting the injustices because that is part of the process. We also need to be organised. We need to work with governments to change the bad laws. We need to work to change the way that healthcare is provided to bring cannabis into routine and frontline healthcare, not at the margins as a last resort. And by when I say mainstream healthcare, I mean you should be able to get it on a subsidised prescription if it works and if it is safe and cost effective, in the same way you get your diabetes medication on a subsidised prescription. So a lot of people say, oh yeah, but you know it's gonna be expensive. You know what, a lot of drugs are expensive and the government pays for them if they are safe, effective um, and cost effective. And I have no doubt that many of the cannabinoids will be proven to be so. So at the end of the day, the medication should cost six bucks twenty for a month's supply if you're on a healthcare card, like other medications. Um, and ultimately we need to change the way the community understands what cannabis is so that users are not discriminated against. And at the end of the day, look, I've given up talking about stigma because stigma makes it sound as though, oh yeah, you took some offence. No, this is discrimination, what is happening to many of the people in society that are having to resort to what at the moment is illegal activities to be able to source their medicine. I can talk forever and ever and ever. I'll shut up there though. That is my email and you can uh, contact us and there'll be flyers on our surveys out there soon. Thank you. Lovely, okay, so I'll answer this very, very quickly because again, this is a, let's, you know, we could have a three hour discussion on, on, on how to do this and even then we still will be trying to figure it out. Very quickly, so there's two things that we, I think we can be done relatively easily, well, done about easily, but can be done. So one is the issue of amnesty. All amnesty means is that police and governments will not prosecute, but amnesty does not provide access to medications. It makes it easier for people to access, but it's still people having to run around and find their sources. And some people have their sources, but the vast majority haven't. Um, so amnesty is one thing. The other, the other issue then, compassionate access, is c is there a way of being able to fast track that whilst we're waiting for the good medicines, you know, the stuff that is, has been shown to work and blah, 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 are there ways that we can use stuff that is still good enough, and I still think we need, if you're gonna be talking about treating sick people, we still need standards in what is given to them, I would argue, but you know, look, that's, that's just me. 
Well, so the amnesty is for already using it. So the idea of if people want to keep using what they're using because it works, that comes in an amnesty model, and they're using it so they have got access to it. So amnesty should at least cover them. But there's a lot of people out there that aren't using anything, don't know where to get it from, and then the question is how do you make supply available to them? And that could just happen in an amnesty model. Yep, they could join the, the Facebook page and figure out that, that as well. But I also think that there is a, you know, that there is a role to be able to point uh, patients and families into the direction of being able to legally access this as part of your health care in the immediate future. That could be done by getting, you know, we don't have any GMP grown cannabis in Australia at this point in time. That doesn't mean we don't have some high quality gear, we do, but GMP is a regulated stamp of approval which means you've grown it, we've tested it, we know it's this pretty much every time of quality standards, no nasties in there. So we, it would be great for us to be able to have uh, you know, a sanctified, you know, government approved, this meets qualities of production. As soon as you have qualities of production, then I think you can very rapidly roll out a compassionate access program. So if we're not going to supply it, then amnesty will be enough. If we want to supply it, then we've got to figure out how do we get a GMP source real quick. The quickest way to do that is import it because we can import GMP gear now. And we are, for, for many of our trials, we are importing you know, Canadian, Dutch um, um, cannabis products. They've got GMP, we don't. Uh, it's going to take us a year or two to have an Australian GMP quality product. And that's, it's either getting existing growers to become GMP'd, takes about a year, or get GMP approved companies to grow cannabis. So either way, it's uh, one to two years away from having a local product. Until then, if we want to give drugs out to people, then I think, you know, probably import. But the key thing is, let's come up with a good standard for now. Yeah, well, thank, Amy, thank you so much for coming and uh, sharing uh, like really the research and science perspective. And, and, uh, and again, if, if, if people want to sort of assist in some of this journey, do the surveys. It's not just our survey, but look, if you can, I can understand why people, a lot of people are really hesitant about what does research mean. Not all research is a randomised controlled trial. Sometimes we have to do them. But some research really is just tell us what you're doing, and that often will help. Um, and so these kinds of online surveys, please, I uh, will put the flyers out, and if you can log on and do it, that'd be great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, it's been really great.